front of you, you have a small pile of paper. Yeah. The first five pages is section 165 of the Capital Kings. And yes. If we could please put that behind um, at the end of the section 169 in the authority fund, which I'm hoping is tab two. It is mentioned in my skeleton argument, but it was omitted from the um, authority fund. I apologize for that. Um, yes. And the second is the case of Derry in the Supreme Court, um, which it is new. It wasn't mentioned in my skeleton argument. I supplied it to my learned friend yesterday um, evening. Um, and essentially, it, it makes, I say, it makes good certain points made in my skeleton argument and replaces essentially who the other authorities are. I was going to refer to. So, if we could put that at the end, please. Um, right. Just to, to know where it is in the bundle. Well, while we're on supplementary documents, um, I think it's right, isn't it, that you, perhaps as an agreed statement, would put before the upper tribunal after the hearing about the history of all this? There wasn't an agreed statement. There were was there, were exchanges of submissions. Oh, on all right. Well, I think we'd like to see those, if we may. Yes. Um, we'd also like to see uh, a representative settlement. Yes. I've asked behind. Uh, were the settlements actually before the tribunals below? It seems a little odd that we're talking about them without actually having seen one. That's really. Mm, or was it all done on the basis of a statement of agreed facts? Um. So I think in your skirt and argument, you refer to HMRC's statement of case, which we also haven't got in the bundle. Yes, my lord. Um, I don't remember is the answer to my Lord's question. Um, we could certainly find out. Sorry, it's, it's just really almost a matter of, sort of instinct. I feel rather unhappy talking about a settlement without actually having having seen it. Um, there, were, you know, there were various trust law issues which might arise. We, it seems to be common ground as an interest in possession. I'd just like to see what it looks like. Was it, it a light interest? Who's the set law? And is Quentin Skinner the set law? Or? Yes, my Lord. Right. And he's the father of the he's three. The father. Yes, my lord. Okay. And who are the trustees? Himself and another individual. Mr. Skinner and another individual. I'm instructed, but we can I of see. course get you a, a copy of uh, an example set, my lord. Thank you very much. And sorry, just before I forget, certainly in my copy of the authorities, the extracts from the Finance Act 1985 are all cropped, or at least every other page seems to be cropped at the right. So, and also some lines that missing at the bottom. So could we have a proper copy of those at some point? Yes, my lord, I'm not sure why that should be the case, but it's Well, I'm afraid it is, at least in, yeah. um, for example, including one or two quite material, possibly quite material pages. Yes, my lord, well, of course we'll afford that. I mean, that, that is actually the, the copy that HMRC supplied to the upper tribunal after the hearing, um, which I've relied on again. <laughs> um, well, I'm afraid. Well, let me show you how much it was referred to, but anyway, there it is. Yes, my lord. Right. Well, I can tell you, Mr Firth, that we've read the skeleton arguments and we have read both tribunal decisions. I'm grateful, my lord. Well, you have my skeleton argument, which is the step-by-step -step response to the other tribunal, and I adopt it. But this call obviously has to form its own view on avoiding statutory construction and deriving whatever assistance you consider appropriate from the decisions below. So what I'm going to do in this hearing with um, is focus on aspects that, in my submission, will benefit most from oral submission. Yeah. I turn first to the ordinary meaning of section 169J, but as I did in my skeleton order, I, I place emphasis on logical structure and clarity. And that's um, where the Derry decision comes in. If I may refer you, please, to parts of it. It didn't concern the Capital Gains Tax Act. It concerned rewrite legislation. But nevertheless, in my submission, some assistance may be gained by seeing how the Supreme Court approach those questions. Not, not my favorite case, because they overruled me, but never mind. <laughs> my lord, you're upheld on other grounds. <laughs> um, but yes, I, I hope that, that will be forgiven. But in terms of um, what they did say at paragraph 7 we've got the statement
statutory framework. And could I ask yeah. please, the court to read 7 through to 11? ordering. Make it clearer and easier to use it. Yes. In particular, um, emphasize paragraph 10. Yeah. At the same time, I would emphasize the task should be approached from the standpoint that the resulting statutes are intended to be relatively easy to use, not just by professionals, but also by the reasonably informed taxpayer, and that the signposts are there for a purpose, in particular to give clearer, clear pointers to each stage of the taxpayer's journey to fiscal enlightenment. Right. And that's relevant yeah. when we come to the this legislation because it was enacted in Finance Act 2008 and what I hope to show is that actually a lot of what you see in terms of structure and clarity <coughs> and rewrite projects you find in the Finance Act 2008 entrepreneurs relief um, legislation. Before I go there could we please um, read paragraphs 35 to 38 if you want to see the issue in the case that's set up succinctly in paragraph 26 then the issues in the case have started at 35 to 38. This goes to your construction of 1690, principally, these paragraphs. Well, the whole I'm about to show you the whole thing, my lord, yeah. because I say it's in the form of essentially rewrite type style, yeah. which yeah. makes these principles um, relevant, in particular the care taken to walk the taxpayer through yeah. their journey to fiscal enlightenment. Yeah. So with, with that in mind, please, could you turn to the legislation that's behind tab two, beginning at 169H, page 16 of the authority.
section 169H gives you a logical structure, tells you what the relief is. Subsection 2 then tells you that there are three types of qualifying business disposals. And in particular, you can see at the end of each limb, it says C, that particular section. That's where you need to go. It then introduces sections 169L and LA, and then breaks down the remainder of the chapter in subsections 4 to 7. Section 169M is about making a claim, 169N to P, make provision as to the amount of contract relief, etc. But in terms of clarity, structure, and logical thinking, we can see that that is the primary, it, it, the prime focus in this legislation, which is written around the time of the rewrite policy. So we're told to refer to, subset, to section 169J, the disposal of trust business assets. <coughs> and if we could please turn to 169J, which is on page 22. come at this in my submission with the assumption that it was intended to be as simple to understand and follow as possible, adopting a logical structure. And in fact, we see the signpost. So you can see in subsection 1, there is a disposal of trust business assets where A, the trustees of a settlement make a disposal, C, subsection 2. B, there is an individual who's a qualifying beneficiary, C, subsection 3. C, the relevant condition is met. C, subjections 4 and 5. So we, we see again these cross-references, which are a structural part of this legislation. And what we say, as you'll have seen from our skeleton argument, is that there is a logical structure in 169J. Limb A of subsection 1 is the link between the trust and the company. It requires the trustees to dispose of settlement business assets, i.e. shares. 1B is the link between the individual and the trust. It requires there to be, at the time of a disposal, a qualifying beneficiary. And that means a person who has an interest in possession, either in the whole, the settled property, or the part which includes the business asset. And then we come to the contentious part, C of subsection 4 which are the link between the individual and the company. They ask whether that individual held 5% of the ordinary share capital and voting rights and was an officer or employee of the company whose shares have been disposed of for one year. Can, can you just help me on this, my journey to fiscal enlightenment? Yes, my lord. Um, what happens if the trustees own 100% of the shareholder? How, how does it get to be the qualifying beneficiary's private personal company? There is a definition in 169S. Yes. But well, if the trustees hold the shares and the qualifying beneficiary has an interest in possession in the settlement under which the shares are held, on the face of it, um, I must have missed something somewhere, the trustees get no relief at all. But if, correct, if they hold 90% and the individual holds 10%, then they do. That's correct, my lord. I'm going to come on to some of the arbitrary features of section 1690 later, but my lord, you were right, that is, a, that is the effect of requiring the um, qualifying beneficiary to have a 5% interest for this one year period in the, in, the, in the company. Seems very odd. It does, my lord. Um, there's not much more you can say about that, is there? <laughs> but that's, you, you accept that's, that's what the legislation yeah. says. That's what it says. That's what I haven't it says. missed some deeming provision or... Not as far as I'm aware. Obviously, my learned friends will, will, will um, tell you in due course if, if we have missed something. But no, if, if the trustee owns from day one 100% of the company, then there is no way the qualifying beneficiary can satisfy the personal company requirement. That's I mean, the answer may be, at least it occurred to me, a possible answer might be in the context of capital gains tax, um, in a situation where the trustees own 100% of the shares, then for better or for worse, that company is a trustee investment. And there's no basis for treating a beneficiary as though it were that beneficiary's personal company. 
Yeah. The inheritance tax position is rather different because somebody with an interest in possession is treated, or at least used to be treated, used as be, the yeah. beneficial owner of the entirety of the settled property in which the interest in possession subsists. That's right. My but here, it seems to be common ground that the, be the words interest in possession should be given the same meaning as in the inheritance tax legislation as elucidated in Pearson. Yes, that's not in dispute. Again, it's not, it's not immediately obvious why that should be the case, but I'm not, not, I'm not quarrelling with that. As I <laughs> but, I mean, it, it, well, you'd have seen from my skeleton that our, our case and the purpose of this is it's an extension of the individual well, relief, which it, makes indeed. sense of the requirements. I mean, that's why in, in perhaps you, know, you could have started with 169i, which is what tells you what happens in the case of an individual, because that's the actual run-up to 169j. <laughs> it is, my lord. And <laughs> Perhaps I should have started there. I'm certainly coming back to I'm sure you are, and I didn't mean to. It, you, it's a point one has to come to at some point. Absolutely. Um, like any legislative code, you have to begin at page one and read one's right way through it to the end yes. at some point. Yes. Yes, of course. Um, but in terms of the, the point I'm, I'm trying to make now, so I was, I was taking you through what I say is yes. the logical structure. Absolutely. I quite follow that. But sorry, just if I may, because these are just two tiny points really about interests in possession. Firstly, there's a the point about one having to go to the authorities on inheritance tax to elucidate that, which is, I think, as you say, common ground. Secondly, what, what's meant by otherwise than for a fixed term? What does a fixed term mean in this context? Well, my interpretation would be, say, five years is a fixed term, but for life it's not a fixed term. Well, I think that must be right. I mean, in, in a sense, life is fixed. We all know. You, you can. You know when it begins. <laughs> you know when it ends. <laughs> well, if, if if that wasn't right, it, it, we might end up with nothing satisfying. Then. Um, I think it must mean a fixed term where you know from the beginning, not only the commencement yes. date but also the termination date. But equally, yes. Yeah. I mean, if it's brought to an end earlier by exercise of power or indeed death before the end of the fixed term, then that that still satisfies the terms of legislation. Um, it's not clear to me why they they would choose to distinguish between a long interest in possession for a fixed term and a, an interest in possession for life, but there you have it. Well, I know, it does, all, it does seem rather peculiar, and equally, presumably, a life interest qualifies, even if it's subject to overriding powers which might enable it to be well, cut it down does. or overridden. It does. it does, and there's no specification as to the extent of the interest in possession, so if you have a 10% interest in the whole, the remainder could be accumulated, and you still get 100% relief. I'll come back to that in the context of 1690, but yes. <laughs> the, these are the way it, it does work, but in terms of trying to understand it for the purpose of our question, I, I've made my submission, there is a logical structure there. Yeah. And my submission is, it's common ground, it does at, at least those things. HMRC's submission it says, well, and there's an extra bit on the end of 1C that requires you to also be a quali the qualifying beneficiary or a qualifying beneficiary throughout the period for which you satisfy personal company and employee test. Yeah. So that's, that's the dispute between us. But at the very least, it does do the things that I say it does. And in my submission, there's a clear and logical structure that you're dealing <coughs> first with the link between the trust and the company, then the individual and the trust, and then the individual and the company. And that's logical and understandable. And I think it's inherent in your submission is that once one has found who the qualifying beneficiary is, then subsequent references to the qualifying beneficiary are just a label. That, that, that is precisely the point I make, my lord, and in fact the point I'm going to make right now, my lord, because if you look please at 1b, it refers to a qualifying beneficiary. Yeah. And that is the only reference, other than the definition, to a qualifying beneficiary. Everything else is a reference to the qualifying beneficiary, including in 4. So you say the definite article simply means you look at the individual who's been identified in 169J3. Yes, ma'am. And you could do it algebraically by like just defining that person as X and putting in X wherever you come across the Precisely. qualifying beneficiary. Precisely. And, and, and that's that construction and this importance of re the reference to a qualifying beneficiary in B, which is the first time we see that, and then thereafter, other than the definition, to the qualifying beneficiary rather confirms that. But you can take this point further, because if you look at the end of B, you've got a cross-reference, a signpost to subsection 3, which is the definition of, of a qualifying beneficiary. Yeah. It is not the definition of the qualifying beneficiary. And what we 
don't see at the end of C is any cross-reference or signpost to 3, and nor do we see any cross-reference or signpost in subsection 4, which is an omission in my learned friend's case. Because he says when you get to either C or subsection 4, you do need to go back to 3 and apply it again. And this, this gives rise to the conundrum that I refer to in paragraph 35 of my skeleton argument, which is that if an individual satisfies 1B by virtue of being a qualifying beneficiary at the time of disposal, but is not a qualifying beneficiary throughout a one-year period, is that individual the qualifying beneficiary? So they satisfy a time of disposal, not for any one year period. Are they or are they not the qualifying beneficiary? And the answer must be yes, because otherwise who do we apply subsection 4 to? Because by the time we get to subsection 4, it is working on the basis we already know the, who the qualifying beneficiary is. And it's saying, now apply these tests to that person, mm. X, in my Lord's algebraic language. But on, on my case, if the person fails the test of four, they're still the qualifying beneficiary, but you just haven't passed all the conditions for relief. On my learner friend's construction, then you need to be a qualifying beneficiary not only at the time of disposal, but also throughout this one year period. If you're not the qualifying beneficiary throughout that one year period, are you the qualifying beneficiary or not? And my learned friend doesn't seem to answer that in his skeleton argument as far as I can see. But it's a big problem with this case, because if the answer is no, then who do we apply the test in subsection 4 to? If you have to satisfy the test in subsection 4 in order to be the qualifying beneficiary, you end up in a circularity. Because if you don't satisfy the test, you're not the qualifying beneficiary, therefore we don't apply the test. But in order to know who to apply the test to, you have to be the qualifying beneficiary. And that, that's a big problem with my learned friend's case. Whereas on my case, it's simply the person who is a qualifying beneficiary at the time of disposal. They are thereafter the qualifying beneficiary. There's another structural point, if I may make it now, which is that given that B clearly deals with the link between the individual and the trust, it would be surprising as to why Parliament would deal directly with the link between the individual and the trust in B, but then at a further condition relating to the link between the individual and the trust in condition C, apparently in the context of addressing the connection between the individual and the company. So in other words, you say that the attributes of an individual to be a qualifying beneficiary are those which are specified in 169J3 and no other. Yes, my lord, and that I say must be right because otherwise who do we apply subsection yeah. 4 to? Uh, and I made the further point that if there are further attributes, why would Parliament not say so clearly? Because again, we're approaching this from the, from the perspective that this appears to be drafted with simplicity, logic, and ease of understanding in mind. And if, if you have in mind that you want to communicate to the reader, who may or may not be a professional, then not only must you be a, quali a benef qualifying beneficiary at the time of disposal, but also throughout this one year period, you would not do so in this way. This is not the words you would use. The, in 
entirety of HMRC's case, as you'll know, well, the entirety of HMRC's case on 169J, as you'll know from this guy's <coughs> argument, is based on 169J4. And they say the reference to the qualifying beneficiary is importing the definition in subsection 3. But for the reasons I've already been through, that doesn't fit. Subsection 3 is the definition of a qualifying beneficiary. Yeah, no, you made that point. I made that point. We've got the point about no cross-reference, and we've got the point about it assuming we already know who the person is. Yeah. And for, for what it's worth, the explanatory notes support this. And if I could refer you to please to page 96, in the authorities bundle. Paragraph 24, the explanatory notes. Yeah. And what it says in the, four, the end of the third line, the fourth line is, the condition applies to the qualifying beneficiary, the test that would have applied under 169A. I six or seven. I'll come back to the importance of that. What I take for present purposes is that it's understanding one subsection four in terms of applying a test to a person, to the qualifying beneficiary. Again, assuming we already know who that person is. And there's no reference to an extended requirement to have an interest in the trust during the one year period. Yeah. Um, I noticed the, these are explanatory notes were notes to the bill. Sometimes they reissue them after the bill becomes an act. Did the bill, did this part of the bill change at all during its passage through Parliament? I don't believe so, and these notes were sent to us by HMRC, so I, <laughs> I assume that they're the correct notes to be referring to. Right. Okay. If we return, please, to 169J, you've also got the point that we have two references in subsection 4 to the qualifying beneficiary. The second reference, in my submission, is for no other purpose than to identify a particular individual. We already know who that individual is. But if that's right, why do we in, in, add any additional import to the first reference? Isn't it most isn't it clearest and simplest and most logical to understand these both as simply identifying the qualifying beneficiary on the basis we already know who that is, and we're simply referring to that particular person? I mean, I think you would say that rather supports or at least reflects what you were saying about the rather formulaic way in which tax law rewrite sections are cast, which can sometimes read rather plonkingly where you might expect to use a simple possessive pronoun or something instead, but does have the benefit of clarity. Yes. But certainly isn't intended to introduce any distinctions in no. the meaning to be attributed to a defined phrase like qualifying beneficiary, depending on where you happen to find it. Precisely, my lord. And, and it would be contrary to the very purpose of simplicity and ease of understanding to, to do so. Because on HMRC's case, we, we deal with the link between the individual and the trust in 1B and cross-referred to three, but then without any signpost or reference, simply the reference to the qualifying beneficiary in four suddenly imports that definition in three again, even though it's the definition of a qualifying beneficiary. Mm -hmm. And it's all all by, uh, at the very, the very most on HMRC's case, some, some very, very <coughs> careful reading and, and careful thinking that not at all obvious and really probably wasn't in the mind whoever wrote this. Yes. Then we come to subsection three. So this is the definition of a qualifying beneficiary. And it says an individual is a qualifying beneficiary if the individual has under the settlement an interest in possession, otherwise than for a fixed term, in A, the whole of the settled property, or B, a part which consists of or includes <coughs> the settlement business assets disposed of. And my submission is that makes sense if this test is being applied at the time of disposal. Because at the time of disposal, the trust will necessarily own the business assets disposed of. 
But if we try and apply them at an earlier point in time, as HMRC would have us do, if the beneficiary has an interest in the whole settled property, it does not matter whether the trust owns any shares. Because if you read Lim A, you simply require to have an interest in the whole settled property. But if we don't have an interest in the whole settled property, we only have an interest in part, then it appears to become a requirement that the trust must own the shares disposed of. And not just some of them, apparently all of them. The assets disposed of. Sorry, say that again. I haven't quite followed it. Of course, my lord. So, if we apply this test at the time of disposal, we end up with no problems because necessarily the trustees will own the shares disposed of. And so an interest in the whole of the settled property will by definition therefore be an interest in the shares disposed of. And equally, <coughs> In B, you're referring to those assets. But if we try and apply a, an earlier point in time, as HMRC would have us do, if beneficiary has an interest in possession of the whole settled property, there's no requirement for the trust to own the shares disposed of because there's no reference in A to settled property, including the shares ultimately disposed of. But if you don't have an interest in the whole, you have something less, then it is apparently a requirement the trust to own the shares disposed of. But the trust, trustees must own the shares to make a disposal of settlement business assets Precisely. consisting of shares. Precisely, Molo, that's the point. Y your point is they might not at, at the earliest stage. Exactly. So mm. my case is the only time we're applying this test is at the time of disposal. Uh, my lord is right. They will necessarily own the shares disposed. But HMRC's case is no, no, we must apply this for a, a one year period that could be ending three years earlier. During that three year period, that one year period, sorry, there is no reason, necessary reason, why the trust will own any or all of the shares ultimately disposed mm. of. On HMRC's case of applying this test earlier, if I have an interest in the whole settled property at that earlier time, I'm okay because it just refers to the whole settled property. But if I have an interest in part of the settled property at that earlier time, I can only qualify as a bene qualifying beneficiary if that part that I have an interest in is the shares or includes the shares disposed of. And so you have this, in my respectful submission, arbitrary and inexplicable distinction between a situation where I have an interest in the whole, no requirement to own shares, in a situation where there's an interest in part, requirement to own not just some of the shares by the looks of it, all of the shares disposed of. So this test makes far more sense if we're just applying it at the time of disposal. So it's a snapshot test which you apply to the actual disposal made by the trustees, and that's, that's it on your case. On the date of disposal, yeah. And once you begin trying to apply the de definition to any earlier point in time, one ends up with all sorts of unanswered questions as to how on earth all meant to work. Exactly. And this forced HMRC and the upper tribunal to say, well, we think they have to own at least one share at the earlier point in time. But that just begs the question of, well, where are we getting that from? So you have, even if you're interested in the whole settled property, they say, well, in order to be a qualifying beneficiary, you have to, the trust has to own at least one share in the company. But that just raises all sorts of questions as to, A, where do we get that from? And B, well, what if there are a number of classes of shares? And what if the shares are acquired or disposed of between now and the, the, the disposal we're looking at? Such that if, if, let's say, we have one share during the one-year period to satisfy HMRC's hypothesized test, but the trustees acquire 10 more shares within a year of disposal and dispose of 11 shares, well, I didn't have an interest in 11 shares back in whenever it was. I had an interest in one share. So do I satisfy? The test in B, does my interest in the trust consist of an interest in the part which includes the business assets disposed of? I have an interest in one share, but not 11 shares. There may be different classes. But these are the imponderable questions, unanswered questions, that my Lord, Lord Justice Henderson refers to. Can you just help me with a, perhaps a more simple question? What is the purpose or logic behind the one-year period in a three-year window? Does any... Is, is there any why one year in a three year window? Why why not three years in a with a one year period?
period at the end. I mean, what's the magic? It's, it's, I think, to do with cases where companies cease trading. Because when we look at the individual's relief, you'll see there's a grace period. Yes. The company ceases trading, then you have a period within which you can dispose of the shares and still benefit from relief. And this seems to be um, some sort of recognition of the same type of period, by the way. Doesn't make quite so much sense, though, does it, in this particular? Well, it, 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 it achieves a similar effect in the sense that if the company stops trading, say, two years before the disposal, then it will still be my personal trading company up to that point two years before disposal, and therefore I can still satisfy the tests in four mm. by reference to one period leading up to the cessation of trading, and therefore I can still get relief when the trust ultimately disposes of the shares two years later. Whereas if you, if you insisted on it being your personal company up to the point of disposal, you would rule out cases where the company ceases trading sometime before disposal, which is not the intention, because we see that in the individual's relief as well, that there's that grace, three-year grace period. And you get that you get that because the company, quote, is either a trading company, unquote. So it's got to be trading during that one year. During the one year period, yes. That so I mean this deals with my learner friend's present tense arguments. But to apply the test in four, we sort of jump into that year and ask what is the case in relation to that company. Yeah. And it has to be a trading company during that one year. <coughs> it's pointed out from behind me, my lord, that also that this, this deals with also retirement situations. And we know it's derived from retirement relief. And when we look at that, we'll see that and a further condition was that you retired at or before the date of disposal. And so you could have a situation where um, the person retires sometime before the date of disposal, and as long as it's within three years, and you can satisfy your officer or employee test by reference to that earlier period of time. So it, it deals with two potential issues. And it's right to say is it, that this so-called entrepreneur's relief, the relevant time, is actually a successor to retirement relief it's, in its well, former incarnations. It, it, it relies... I mean, there's no other bit of the 1992 Act one goes to define retirement relief that it is. Um, no, so retirement relief, I believe, was withdrawn in about 2003, and this was introduced about five years later. Yes. So there was a gap. It wasn't an immediate successor. And, and this explanatory notes say at the end, well, maybe we should look at that just to... What it does say. Um, I mean, they say basically that the old regime has been taken to be carried over. Yes, page one, two, two. Some of the language is used. Yes, my lord, you're, you're right. Page one, two, two, paragraph 124. They're broadly based on the rules for the reform and retirement relief, but the rules for entrepreneurs relief are simpler. Yes. My submission to the other tribunal is that we, we probably shouldn't be looking at the retirement relief legislation for the reasons you, you saw in Derry that the, the primary um, source of understanding this legislation must be in the legislation itself. Um, but if we do look at it, and I, I will show you some parts of it later, then um, we can see what help we get. But in terms of it's being based on it, well, it's broadly based. In the context of retirement relief, the, the three-year period of grace perhaps makes more sense, because when a person retires, there might be all sorts of reasons why that person can't dispose of the business immediately, or it might not be advantageous for market reasons to do so. So one can understand why a period of grace, quite a lengthy period of grace, may be allowed without your losing the relief built up by all your years of personal connection with the company. Yes, my lord, I mean, but it would deal with cases such as where a company ceases trading, perhaps because the person isn't able to sell it, um, yeah. that it's sort of built up assets and reserves over the years, so the disposal is actually going to be a winding up, um, and, and at the time of the disposal you cease trading, well this gives you a period after you stop trading to then wind up the company and, and take out your assets, the yeah, company's assets, sorry, and benefit from entrepreneurs relief. If I may make, so those, those are my sort of key submissions on the text of 169J. If I may just summarize some of the key points. 
first is that if Parliament was intending to require the qualifying beneficiary to be a qualifying beneficiary throughout the one-year period, we say it would have said so in direct terms, as it does for each other requirement. Yeah. Second, we say it's implausible that Parliament would have used a drafting technique that would very naturally be mistaken for simply identifying the relevant in individual to apply the test in subsection 14. Yes. And then you've got the textual issues I've identified. The references to the qualifying beneficiary, not a qualifying beneficiary. The definition being of a qualifying beneficiary, not a definition of the qualifying beneficiary. The cross-references. Subsection 3. And subsection 4, assuming we already know who the qualifying beneficiary is, and therefore who to apply the test to. So we respectfully submit the position reading 169J is very clear. And that would be a reason not to go back to the historical position, but if we do, in my submission, the position becomes even stronger. So if we could please turn to section 70, subsection 3 on page 5. This is the FA 1985. I'm hoping your lordships have the whole of this provision. Sorry, can you give me that reference? Page yeah. 5, my lord, section 70, subsection 3. Um, no. Pages aren't numbered in. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is one of the pages that's been cut off, so we don't actually have the page number. I'm very sorry. Uh, and we don't, I don't think, certainly I don't have the full text. No, I don't have the full text either. One or two of my pages, for reasons I don't quite understand, do have numbers on them, but most of them don't. I think the problem is, is that all three counts are working from electronic copies, which are <coughs> not cut off, and so I think none of us have realised that the court that the hard copies. I'm afraid it's my fault for being um, a Stone Age judge. Like no, no, I see. I, well, I don't, uh, well, so I think, so I, I, I think that's why none of us have appreciated that that's the, that the court has that problem. Um, does anybody, do you have hard copies? The court has the hard copies that we printed. Well, I've actually got the ah. 1985 Finance Act, so I can look at it there. Where does it cut off, if I may ask? Uh, those sub. My, mine in. Um, Subsection three, relief from capital gains tax shall oh, be given, and two right. two conditions, and B, the conditions blah 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 refer to in parag something <laughs> above, but excluding for this purpose an interest for a fixed term and in those sub. Is how my it goes on. And in those subsections, that beneficiary is referred the, to as quotes, I wonder whether it, the qualifying. Obviously, we'll get you hard copies. Sorry. Obviously, we'll get you hard copies, but the UT decision sets, I think, sets out the relevant provisions in full. Oh, right, right. For, uh, for those purposes, just to, as a sort of pragmatic. Right, well, that'll do for the time um, being. Yes, um, but obviously, we'll where in the FTT do we find uh, Upper tribunal. It should be paragraph 7 to 11. 7 to 11. Yeah, that's very clear. Yeah, we've got it. Yes, thank you, Mr. Norbert. That's, that is helpful. Right, well, we can, we, for the time being, we'll work off the upper tribunals. I'm grateful, my lord. So, the, the, this is the equivalent in the retirement legislation of, of what you have in parts of subject of section 169J. You can see, please, that if we read, well, could you please read the whole of 3B, subsection 3B? Yes. And that, in my submission, is quite clearly the equivalent of the combination of 1B and 3 in section 169J. It does the same work. Yeah. And the important, potentially important point, if you were looking at this, is 
is the reference at the end, and in those subsections, that beneficiary is referred to as the qualifying beneficiary, which in my submission confirms what I've said all along, that this is just identifying a particular person that we've already referred to. And I would ask the court to also note, if you please read subsection 4 now, this is the equivalent of subsection 4 in J. Yeah. And the, the point I make here is that HMRC, by HMRC's logic, not only do you have to be a, a or the qualifying beneficiary throughout each of the one year periods referred to in A and B, but logically they must also say you have to remain or be the qualifying beneficiary at the time of retirement referred to in C as well. So it's not just the one year period now, it's the one year period plus retirement plus date of disposal. submission is that if we do look at the historical legislation, the point becomes clearer because quite obviously there, the qualifying beneficiary is used as a label. It says so in terms. I want to move now, unless the court has any questions on 169J, to the wider statutory context, which begins with 169I, which Mr. Henderson referred to earlier. And that's on page 17 the authority bundle. <clears throat> so we see in, in subsection one, <coughs> there is a material disposal of business assets where A, an individual makes a disposal of business assets in the disposal is a material disposal. We see the cross-references again. So again, this is logical instruction. We then go to 2, and it's subsection 2C. The purpose of this chapter, disposal of business assets, is C, a disposal of one or more assets consisting of or of interest in shares or in or securities of the company. And then each, the corresponding requirements to be a material disposal then set out in order, beginning with 3 and 4 for A and B. And then for C, we see subsection 5. A disposal within paragraph C, i.e. the shares, is a material disposal if condition A, B, C, or D is met. And then we go through conditions A, B, C, or D. Condition A is that throughout the period of one year ending with the date of the disposal, the company is the individual's personal company and is either a trading company or the holding company of a trading group, and B, the individual is an officer or employee. Condition B is that the conditions in paragraphs A and B of subsection 6 are met throughout the one year period ending with a date on which the company ceases to be a trading company without becoming a member of a group or ceases to be a member of a trading group without continuing to be a trading company. And that date is within the three year period of the date of disposal. So this is, this is the primary <coughs> individuals making disposals of shares. Notice, please, that the legislation switches from, in one, A, an individual makes a disposal, to subsection six, the individual. <coughs> That's the same switch that we see in J. So <coughs> at the beginning, which in one, subsection one, it refers to a qualifying beneficiary, and then it switches to the qualifying beneficiary. So we've got the six. 
Same switch, and it, all, all it means is that we're referring to the same person we've identified earlier. That's all it's doing. And that's common ground in relation to this subject. And what you will also notice, I hope, and in my submission is correct, is that what's being done with the trust disposal relief is that they've taken essentially the combined effect of A and B and sought to apply those tests in the context of a qualifying beneficiary. And these tests in A and B are what I've referred to as the entrepreneurial connection tests. These are the reasons why you get relief at all. Because you have these entrepreneurial connections with that company. the substance of a text from one subsection and uses that substance again in another subsection, this time 169J4. My submission is that it's extremely unlikely, particularly in the context of rewrite type legislation, emphasizing understanding, extremely unlikely that Parliament intended to impose an additional condition in the second usage of substantially the same text. that's very easily going to be confused with simply applying the substance of the same test. And you've already seen the explanatory notes, but if you want to refer back to them, it's page 96, which yeah. confirms, in essence, that is what this is doing. It's taking the test that would have applied if this was an individual disposal and seeking to apply it to the qualifying beneficiary in the context of a trust disposal. That's all it's doing. It's not adding in a further requirement to also have an interest in possession in the trust, which may or may not own shares for a one-year period at some earlier time. any questions on 169i, the second piece of wider context I wanted to take you to is 169m, which is on page 30. Sorry, just before we leave 169i, I mean, I'm assuming we're not going to get any help from looking at all the other types of disposals of business assets or their circumstances. I think neither side is suggesting they throw any helpful light on the question no, we have to deal with, which is a relief. <laughs> One finds pages and pages of stuff about something called um, EMI shares. Yes. But we can happily forget about all that for now. It's a different way of satisfying the entrepreneurial connection. I see. Yeah, thank you. Yes, so sorry, you were taking us to M. Yes, my lord, that's page 30. And so we, we, we saw this foreshadowed in the structure in 169H, and it says relief is to be claimed. Entrepreneur's relief is to be given only on the making of a claim, subsection 2. A claim for entrepreneur's relief in respect of a qualifying business disposal must be made, A, in the case of the disposal of trust business assets jointly by the trustees and the qualifying beneficiary, and B, otherwise by the individual. Yeah. It's a short point. I'm sure you've already got it, but everyone accepts in this context the reference to the qualifying beneficiary is to the person who was the qualifying beneficiary at the time of disposal. It does not require you to still be, at the time of the claim, a qualifying beneficiary. Everyone accepts that. My learned friend suggests in his skeleton argument there's no temporal requirement in sub subsection 2, but the, the requirement is at the time of the claim. Well, this is a reference to the making of a claim. So on his logic, if the qualifying beneficiary imported the definition, then he would have to say at the time of the claim, you need to be 
a qualifying beneficiary. He doesn't say that, but in my submission, that rather undermines what he says about 169J4. And so, so the, the tie up point there is that we need a very good reason, extremely good reason, why a reference in 169M to the qualifying beneficiary does not import the definition or require a continuing status, but once the reference to the qualifying beneficiary in 169J4 does import the definition and require that status to be satisfied. The third piece of wider context is section 169 N7B, but before we go there, please, could I just remind your lordships of how this part is introduced at subsection 169 H on page 16. In subsection 5 of H, you see sections 169 N 2P make provision as to the amount of entrepreneurs. These are not the conditions for these are the rules that tell us how to get to the amount of relief. N itself is on page 31. <coughs> In subsection 1, we're told that where a claim is made in respect of a qualifying business disposal, you aggregate relevant gains and losses. Then subsection 2 says the resulting amount, so the aggregate of the gains and losses on these business asset disposals, is to be treated for the purpose of this act as a chargeable gain, accruing <coughs> at the time of the disposal to the individual or trustee by whom the claim is made. And then 3, the rate of capital gains tax in respect of that gain is 10%, but this is subject to 4 to 4B. 4 to 4B deal with the lifetime allowance, so you can see in 4, that subsections 4a and 4b apply if the aggregate of the gain on this disposal and in b the total in relation to earlier relevant qualifying business disposals that benefited from relief exceeds at the time 10 million. 4a tells us that the rate is to apply only to so much of the gain mentioned in subsection 2 as does not exceed 10 million. What's a qualifying business disposal? We're going to come to that, my lord. That's right. fine. So earlier relevant qualifying business disposal. Well, the qualifying business disposal is, is those three limbs of H, subsection 2. But the reference to earlier relevant qualifying business disposal is, is defined. And we're going to come to that in, in a moment. And in fact, it's now. It's subsection 7. In subsection 4, earlier relevant qualifying business disposals means... A, where the disposal is made by an individual, earlier qualifying business disposals made by the individual, and early disposals of trust business assets in respect of which the individual is the qualifying beneficiary. So, and this is, a, this is common ground, when you do get the benefit of relief in relation to trust disposals, it comes out of the qualifying beneficiary's lifetime allowance. And what you see here is you're being told to aggregate, essentially, the gains that have qualified for relief in relation to earlier disposals by the individual and earlier disposals by trusts where the individual was the qualifying beneficiary, which makes sense. Or do you use of the present tense? Again, yes. Yeah, so earlier disposals of trust, earlier disposals of trust business assets in respect of which the individual is yeah. the qualifying beneficiary. I mean, exactly. if, it's, if it's earlier, it must be was. <laughs> the draft person is addicted to the present tense. <laughs> well, exactly. You see it in, in 169M again. You say there is references to the qualifying beneficiary. I think in the... Mm. Sort of historic present. Yes. I mean, well, I mean, that rather undermines any reliance upon tenses here, because you're right. It, well, it's a status you have. Once, once you are the qualifying beneficiary at the time of disposal, you, you remain the qualifying beneficiary 
relation to that disposal. Yeah. And, 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 and you can have, because you can have multiple disposals by multiple different trusts, you can be the qualifying beneficiary in relation to a number of different trust disposals. And it doesn't employ any requirement to refer to, to be the qualifying beneficiary, to, to refer to you to as the qualifying beneficiary or is the qualifying beneficiary. We're just identifying, in this case, particular disposals that benefited from relief by virtue of you being the qualifying beneficiary. Again, it's a sort of snapshot technique. I mean, you're looking at particular disposals in the past and use it well notionally, put yourself back yes. and look at those and say, this is the situation in relation to that disposal. This or that is the situation, right? Um, yes, I mean, yes. Or, or you can look at it simply that it's a continue by, by virtue of being a qualifying beneficiary at the time of disposal, you oh, forever see. Yes. are the qualifying yes. beneficiary in relation to that disposal. I see, so it's just the label again, it's my X. It's label. Yes. Yeah. And we see that in B as well, where the qualifying business disposal is a disposal of trust business assets in respect of which an individual is the qualifying beneficiary. Early disposals of trust business assets in respect of which that individual is the qualifying mm -hmm. beneficiary, and earlier qualifying business disposals made by that individual. And the reason it has to refer to the individual is because these earlier business disposals by trusts may be by different trusts. And by reference to different interests in trusts. So the, the whole way this works, subsection 7, and indeed the limit on lifetime allowance, or sorry, the, the using up of lifetime allowance, is by reference to you have a 10 million lifetime allowance, and each time it's used, uh, either because you're the individual making the disposal or you're a qualifying beneficiary, your allowance is used up. And so when we come to later disposals, <coughs> we need to know what your that individual sum total is up to now. And that sum total consists of both disposals by you personally as an individual and disposals by trust in which in respect of which you were the qualifying beneficiary and therefore generated the relief. So that's, that's why the claim has to be made jointly by the yes. trustees and by the beneficiary, because ob yes. obviously the beneficiary might not want to lose. Exactly. exactly. Um, but in interestingly, this bit of the legislation does seem to have be premised on a philosophy rather like that of the inheritance tax. I mean, it treats interests in possession and beneficial ownership as pretty much equivalent for the purposes of using mm -hmm. up the allowance, if nothing else. To an extent it does, my lord, but when we come to we're going to look at O in a moment, you'll see that the 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 relationship between the extent of your interest and the relief you get is not what you might expect from that philosophy. Because yeah. if you have a 10% interest in the whole set of property and the rest is on a 90% accumulation trust for use for discretionary beneficiaries, you get full relief. And we'll see that in O. Because, because and in fact, that's another point to take from N, is that the starting point is you get full relief. If you satisfy those conditions in 169J, mm. you get full relief irrespective of the extent of your interest in possession. There's nothing in N that limits you by reference to your interest in possession, the extent of it.
way to this was because the upper tribunal said, and HMRC seemed to adopt the suggestion that, well, if I was right, then the legislation could simply have referred to made by that or the qualifying beneficiary at the end of B. My submission is that that simply doesn't fit with the rest of the wording here, which is by reference to an individual, both their personal disposals and their trust disposals, and we're identifying what their cumulative total is. Yeah. 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 Then we come on to O, which is on page 33. Amount of relief special provisions for certain trust disposals. And this, as we'll see in a moment, this is an apportionment provision. It's not concerned with the circumstances in which relief is available, but rather it limits the quantum of relief in certain circumstances. And if we read 16901, this section applies where on a disposal of trust business assets there is, in addition to the qualifying beneficiary, at least one other beneficiary who at the material time has an interest in possession in A, the whole, the settled property of B, part which consists of the assets disposed of. And, and you can see immediately that this only applies in therefore certain circumstances. If there is no other interest in possession beneficiary, it does not apply. How, how does it apply? How do you get to the situation where in addition to the qualifying beneficiary, there is another beneficiary who has an interest in possession in the whole of the settled property? Because there's, there's two ways you can structure an interest in possession. Let, let's say the trust owns 100 shares. Mm -hmm. I can either have a 50% interest in 100 shares or right. a 100% interest in 50 shares. I see. So the first important point is that this only applies where there's another beneficiary with an interest in possession. If, as I suggested, the, the balance of the trust is accumulation, I could have a 1% interest in possession and the balance is 99% accumulation. This section doesn't apply. Relief is not restricted. Would the same apply to a discretionary trust? Well, that, that is a discretionary trust, my lord. Well, I'm, I'm positing it is. So accumulate, you accumulate. Well, I suppose you could have a discretionary trust as relation to the income. So they have to distribute it in year, but they get to decide who to. Yes, my lord, that would, that would give rise to the same, the same outcome. But, so let's say 1% is held specifically for me, interest in possession. And the remaining 99% of income has to be distributed. It could be distributed to me. It could be distributed to someone else. But that's not an interest in possession, as my lord suggests. And therefore, we don't get into 1690. Because there's no one else with an interest in possession. There's just a discretionary um, trust of the remaining income. Which shows this is a very narrow provision. That, and sorry, just before I forget, I mean, we are, again, looking here at interests in possession in what one might call, as it were, the historic inheritance tax act sense of that term. And we're not concerned with refinements like qualifying interests in possession, where only certain types of IIP are nowadays treated as being equivalent to outright beneficial ownership and being outside the yes. taxation regime of discretionary trust. Yes. And you, and you see a similar approach, my lord, I don't know if you remember, in relation to stamp duty land tax, when you're looking at um, trust there, it's based on income um, interest. Which, so this is, this is not. It's just slightly odd. The draftsman hasn't chosen to define interest in possession anywhere in this legislation, as far as I can see. But anyway, there it is. <laughs> And I suppose well, act, actually, well, it's, it's incorporating, therefore, by by implication, at least the, the generally understood meaning of interest and possession, which which generally the, the yeah. interest in the income. Well, well, that, yes, and Pearson had to go all the way to the House of Lords in order to work out precisely what kind of <laughs> yeah. income interests were within the definition and which weren't. Yes, yes, my lord. But in, in this case, we. We don't disagree that that is the meaning, and there's no dispute that that was satisfied in relation to these yeah. trusts. Right, so that would support your submission that if you, if the balance of the trust fund 
the 90% on your argument is held on a &M trusts or anyway, any form of non-IIP yeah. trusts, yeah. then this apportionment provision, for whatever reason, simply doesn't bite at all. Exactly. And that undermines, in my respectful submission, HMRC submissions where they, they tend to extract meaning fr from this and say, well, it's all about sort of linking the, the benefits of the trust to the, the interest of the um, qualifying beneficiary. But that's, that's not right for the reasons I've given. That it, 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 you could have a 1% interest in possession and get 100% relief. So, I mean, just to boil down that submission, what you say is that if you are looking at a section which may or may not apply depending on the facts, it cannot change the definition uh, which is set out in an earlier section. Yes. You could, you could only, it would only be permissible to do that if you're looking at a provision which will always apply. Even then, you would say, it's not the right way to do it. But um, if you're looking at a section which may have no application at all on the particular facts, then it can't change the definition. I, I, I do say that, and, and as you say, on these facts, it doesn't apply. In many circumstances, it won't apply. And the circumstances where it does apply are somewhat apparently arbitrary. Um, it would be extremely surprising, is the way we put it in our skeleton argument, if it Parliament expressed itself so badly in 169J, we have to go to what is explained to be um, how you calculate the relief, uh, a provision about how you calculate the relief calculate the relief to find a further additional condition back in 169J, that would be astonishing. We, we shouldn't be doing that. I mean, that, that's, we can look at it for what it's worth, but it kind of alter the clear meaning of 169J. I, mean, I think the point which is made against you, um, and perhaps we're going to come to this anyway, is, is it's said to be implicit in the wording of subsection 1 of 169O, but when you go back to the material time, the drafter seems to have assumed that at that date the qualifying beneficiary would have had an interest in possession, which in turn is said to suggest that therefore the trust connection has to be satisfied not only at the date of disposal, but also at the material time, which is defined as the end of the latest period of one year ending in the three-year window. So it could be any number of dates in the previous four years. Yes, that, that, that is in my submission, the tenuous basis for saying 1690 um, tells us what the meaning of 169J is. And my, my, my submission is, is that there is no assumption that you will have an interest at the earlier time. It's simply the case that if you do, then these provisions apply in the way shown. And, and to pick up a point that my Lord Sir Lancelot Henderson made a little earlier, this is another snapshot provision. It is. Whereas what HMRC want to say is that there is a more than a snapshot. You've got to have been the qualifying beneficiary throughout a particular period, which is not what 16906 says. It's another snapshot. It, it is another snapshot. And in fact, my Lord, that leads into a, a further problem with my learned friend's case, which I didn't specifically see addressed in, in their skeleton argument, which is 16905. And that says, it, well, I don't know if we, we didn't read four, but the four says, we started to, in fact, only the relevant proportion for the amount that otherwise would qualify for relief is treated as so resulting. And the balance is chargeable. For, for the purposes of this section, the relevant proportion of an amount is the same proportion of the amount as that which, at the material time, the qualifying beneficiary is interested in the income bears to the interest in that income of all other beneficiaries, including the beneficiary, who have interest in possession. So it's based on comparing your interest in possession to the totality of other interest in possession, but again, leaving out discretionary income and accumulated income. <coughs> and it, then we don't need to know what the qualifying beneficiary's interest is, and that's what subsection 5 tells us. In subsection 4, the qualifying beneficiary's interest means the interest by virtue of which he is the qualifying beneficiary not any other interest the qualifying beneficiary may have. Now, on my, on my submission, you identify whether a person is the qualifying beneficiary or not at a single point in time, disposal. So we will know what that interest is because there's only one point in time at the time of disposal. On HMRC's submission, you need to be a qualifying beneficiary throughout this one year period and at disposal. And within that time, your interest could change, grow, 
be taken away um, or, or added to. How do we decide when within that those two periods, what well, the one year period and the date of disposal, what part of that or what specific date in that is the time at which we just decide whether you that's the interest by virtue of which you are this qualifying beneficiary? Isn't the answer to that found in the definition of the material time as meaning the end of the latest period of one year? I mean, that, that is pointing to a single date, albeit a rather arbitrary looking one. Well, well, so that would be that's the date at which you would do your snapshot. Well, in my submission, no, my lord, because if, if, if it was always the material of the date, you wouldn't need five. Because on that, if that's right, if HMRC are right, then the, 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 it's difficult to see how there could be a difference between one of the interests or the sequence of interests by virtue of which you are the qualifying beneficiary and the interest you have in the material at the time, there, there wouldn't be a difference. Whereas five is clearly assuming that there might be a difference between the interest you have in the material at the time and the interest by virtue of which you are the qualifying beneficiary. Otherwise, it doesn't need to tell us. I'm not sure they're dealing with the same thing, are they? I mean, the five I, I see is important and necessary to make it plain that in the case of the qualifying beneficiary, you're looking at the interest which makes him the qualifying beneficiary for the purposes of this mini code and nothing yes. else. But if, if, the period, if the periods of time which make you the qualifying beneficiary include the material time, then there can be no difference between the interest, the sequence of interest you hold during that <coughs> period of time and the interest that makes you the qualifying beneficiary. Whereas this is assuming that there might be a difference between the interest that makes you the qualifying beneficiary mm. and the interest you hold in the material date. Otherwise, it doesn't need to tell us. Because let, let's assume you, you have let's assume you have twenty percent interest at the material time, and on the date of disposal you have a ten percent interest. On my on my analysis, the interest that makes you the qualifying beneficiary is the ten percent. On HMRC's analysis, how do you decide? And my lord suggests, well, isn't it just the material date? Well, in that case, you're always going to go to the 20%, so you don't need to be told it's the interest that makes you a qualified beneficiary. But you still have this tension. Well, how can, how can the 20% be the interest that makes you the qualified beneficiary, not the 10%? Well, you're just saying that subsection 5 assumes that there is a single number. I mean, it's the. It's a, it's a single. It's the use of the word the again. It assumes there's a single point in time, my lord. But it could be dealing with a different point, couldn't it? it? I mean, the qualifying beneficiary might have an interest in possession, say, in 10% of the trust fund, and also be a discretionary benefit of 90% of it. So well, in that case, one needs this section in order to tell us to concentrate only on the, beneficiary, the beneficiary's interest in possession under the settlement. I see some heads being nodded <laughs> on the revenue side, so maybe that particular point I'm... But I, I think your point is it serves that purpose. Um, i.e. excluding any other interest the qualifying beneficiary may have, but it still presupposes singular interest in the first line of the steps. Yeah. Five. But it, it may, may well, my lord, make that point clear if it needed to be made clear, although I think you'd probably get that from one and four in any event. Um, but it's still the snapshot point. That, that yeah. It assumes there's a single point in time yeah. we can determine this. As in HMRC's case, we've got a one-year period Okay, but on, a it seems to me on any view, subsection 5 does have work to do, even on the revenues construction. And one thing that a tax law drafts person does like to do is to spell things out, even if they're not always 100% necessary. I, I understood, my lord. I don't dis disagree with that. Um, but what I, I do say is that my lawyer friend has a difficulty in identifying um, where he says that you're the qualified beneficiary by virtue of a, an extended period of time. What, what do you do about that? I absolutely understand that point, yes. Well, that's, that's, that's as much as I seek to extract from that. Right, where do we go next?
Um, I doubted my skills in argument with the upper tribunal's reliance on the material time. I, I don't propose to say anything about that order. It's just, you know, it's not, I don't think it's one of the strongest points against me. Um, well, that, that I think, is, is what I want to say about the text of this legislation. And then we come on to the purpose. And the preliminary point, as I'm sure this court appreciates, is primarily you're getting the purpose, or need to get a purpose, from the text and uh, the explanatory notes. So it, it, this bit could end up being a bit circular if my learned friend says, well, if this is the purpose, and I'm right about the interpretation, they fit together neatly. And if I say, no, no, that's not the purpose, this is the purpose, and this is the interpretation, they fit together neatly, you're none the wiser at the end of it in your journey to fiscal enlightenment. But nevertheless, what I do say is that the purpose of the trust relief is, as a, is an extension of the individual's relief. And it makes sense as such. So we saw in 169i that for an individual to get relief, they must satisfy the personal company requirement, which requires 5% ownership in votes. And if you do satisfy that requirement, then you get relief for all shares disposed of, irrespective of how long you've owned them. And that's a fundamental feature of the individual. Into, into an example, if I have 5% for my one year period building up to dispose and I satisfy the employee condition, and a month or two months before disposal, I acquire another 50%. When the time for disposal comes, I will get relief on the whole 55%, not just the 5%. There's no limit on how long you must have held any shares other than the 5% that meets the entrepreneurial connection. And that, that, I understand, is entirely uncontroversial. It's the ordinary and expected way the relief works. At this point, if I could just refer you to section 165, which I, I suggest that you put at the back of um, tab two. This is relief for gifts of business assets. says in subsection 1, if an individual makes a disposal otherwise than under a bargain at arm's length of an asset within subsection 2 and a claim for relief is made, then subject to certain other provisions, subsection 4 shall apply. The effect of subsection 4 is essentially to roll over the gift into the transferee's hands. So they take over your base cost and, and therefore have the late in gain. Subsection 2 tells us which assets this applies to. And B, it consists of shares or securities of a trading company or the holding company of a trading group where the shares or securities are not listed. Or the trading company or holding company is the transfer as personal company. And the simple point is this, that any shares that satisfy the entrepreneur's relief requirements will also satisfy the 165 requirement. And what this means is that in practice you can gift shares to a person who does qualify for entrepreneurship, relief, hold over the gain, and then they benefit from relief in relation to those shares. Irrespective of how long they've held them for. And indeed in this case if Mr. Skinner, instead of putting the shares into trust for his sons, had simply given the shares to his sons, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be troubling this court because there'd be no doubt that entrepreneurship relief applies. So it is entirely possible to organize the ownership of a company in a way that best achieves relief under the entrepreneurship relief. Can I just put you another scenario which crossed my mind? Supposing you have a, an individual shareholder with a personal company 
and he decides to set up a settlement under which he will take an interest in possession. Um, and duly does that and transfers the shares to the trustees. Now that transfer itself is a disposal for capital gains tax purposes, I think. But would it be right that on that disposal he could actually claim the entrepreneur's relief as an individual? I mean, the, the disposal doesn't have to be, uh, it, it could be to trustees of a settlement, is that right? The disposal could be to trustees, yes. Yes. Um, and if it's into a trust, then you might expect to hold over the relief in any event. Well, you might in any event, but if you didn't, well, you might prefer to cash in. Well, maybe, maybe I've used up my entrepreneurship. You might have used up your 10 million pounds. And I would like course. to hold over on uh, yes. in the trust. But yes, I mean, that, but that's, that's an ordinary situation. Um, which is actually one of the points I make towards the end of my skeleton argument, which my interpretation deals with, and HMRC's reaches a surprising conclusion. So you could have a person who's owned the company in the way my Lord describes for many years, been an employee for many years, they decide to put it into trust, yeah. and give an interest, they even decide to take an interest in possession, resi residue to their children. And it, on HMRC's interpretation, unless that trust operates for a whole year, at least a whole year, you can't get relief, which is surprising given that I've owned this, I've owned these shares of this company for who knows how long. I've been employed for who knows how long. That's clearly satisfied the entrepreneurial connection. Yeah. Um, but unless I, if I put them into trust, I have to when, wait at least a year before I can access the relief. Whereas on my construction, we just see this as a continuation of the individual's ownership, the continuation of the individual's <coughs> relief. So you don't need to wait any particular time before you dispose of some or all the shares. Yeah. Just to satisfy my idle curiosity, what does the company do? Or what did it do? Administered insurance for debt. Administered insurance for debt. The company was DFAS. Um, administered insurance. For dentists and, and oh, for dentists, right. Thank you. And it, there's been VAT litigation involving DFAS for many years. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that I hope satisfies your curiosity. Yes, it does. Thank you. in terms of trying to understand the purpose is that in the individual case you get relief really for all your shares irrespective of how long you've owned them as long as you satisfy the entrepreneurial connection test and further you can organise ownership in the most beneficial way. Trusts raise special issues as to how you can satisfy the entrepreneurial connection. One option would have been to look at the connection between the trust and the company. You could require the trust to own 5% for one year. But that's not the option that's been selected. Instead, Parliament has required that there be an individual who has the standard entrepreneurial connection in his or her own right, as in non-trust cases. And it says if that's satisfied, we extend entrepreneur's relief to the trust of which that person is an interest in possession beneficiary at the time of disposal. And that is why I say we see it, we certainly Submit it should be seen as an extension of the individual's relief. And that's confirmed yeah. confirmed by the fact that it's the individual's lifetime allowance that is reduced <coughs> by the relief granted to the trust.
Yes. It's also supported to some extent by the explanatory notes which I've shown you, which says we are applying the same test that we would have applied if it was an individual to the qualifying beneficiary. So the, the, the conceptual framework which Parliament's gone for is to say, in a trust case, we're not going to require the trust to own the shares for any particular period of time or to have some entrepreneurial connection with the company. <coughs> Rather, what we're going to say is that if there's an individual who does satisfy the ordinary entrepreneurial connection test, then if they are an interest and possession beneficiary of the trust, then the trust can benefit from relief. And that's why we say it's an extension. Given that given that the entrepreneurial connection is established directly between the individual and the beneficiary, sorry, individual beneficiary and the company, not through the trust. The trust getting relief is equivalent to the individual getting relief for those shares that they didn't hold for one year. Yeah. So that's what we say about the purpose, and we think we believe there is support for the reasons I've given from the text. <coughs> HMRC's contention appears to be along the lines, and I'll obviously leave my own friend to explain, but it appears to be along the lines of that, well, what's needed is some sort of enduring connection between the beneficiary and the trust in order to justify giving the trust relief. to require the beneficiary to have an interest in a possession in a trust for a year during which the trust may or may not own shares in the company, and indeed when the, the trust may not exist. And that's the ordinary case I referred to before where someone decides to put their, has a business for many years, decides to put their business in trust, gives themselves an interest in possession for this residue to children. If that, tr if that trust were then to sell, of the asset, sell the assets within the one year, on HMRC's case, no relief. On my case, relief. I say that makes sense because it's just a continuation of the individual's ownership. <coughs> so then we, let's test HMRC's enduring connection test. So I've, I've already made the point that you need to get purpose out of the words of the legislation. I find it very difficult to see how many HMRC do get the purpose out of any of the words. But let's test it against the words. So HMRC say that on their construction, we end up with an enduring link between the individual and the trust that justifies the quantum of relief. But we say that that's not right, because I refer you back to my examples before, the interest in possession of 1% and the rest on accumulation and maintenance trust or discretionary income. You end up with 100% relief. So there's no purpose here of aligning the relief to the extent of the interest of the beneficiary. I also refer in my skeleton argument 100 to 101. <coughs> to the fact that even on HMRC's construction, you can adjust interest in possession. And as long as you've got the right, <coughs> as long as you've got the right combination and the material date, it doesn't matter what they were at some earlier time. So you could have a 1% interest in possession for 364 days of the one year period. On the material date, or for the material date, your interest in possession goes up on HMRC's case to, let's say, 100%. And then it could come down again by the date of disposal. What that, I mean, that, that, we'll call it manipulation without intending any, uh, any acceptance of what that might imply, but that shows that what this is achieving is not the sort of enduring link that my learned friend would like us to be seeing in this legislation. And there's a, there's a, a third point, which is that why is the one year connection with the trust in the year sometime before disposal? Sorry, why is a one year connection with the trust in terms of interest and possession in the year building up to disposal ignored unless it happens to overlap with the, the year in which the entrepreneurial connection was satisfied? So 
you can have a situation where it is my personal company because the entrepreneurial connection test was satisfied in a period ending three years ago. If I didn't have interest in possession, then maybe the trust didn't exist. The trust then comes into existence, and I have an interest in possession for a full year building up to disposal, but unless those two conditions are satisfied during that time, my one year enduring connection with the trust does not satisfy the terms of the legislation of HMRC's construction, because it doesn't overlap with the one year period when the entrepreneurial connection was satisfied. In this case, the qualifying beneficiaries held an interest in possession of the trust throughout the whole period when the trust owned shares. So HMRC's objection in this case is that A, the trust didn't exist before then, or and or B, you didn't have an interest in the trust when it didn't own shares. But it's difficult to discern why that pro those problems, those facts should lead to a denial of relief, given that we held an interest in possession of the trust throughout the whole period when it did own shares. And then you can test it, HMRC's suggestion of purpose in another way, which is, I've, I've probably made this point before, but if that is your purpose, and in fact HMRC say this relief only makes sense if there is a substantial enjoying link between the, the beneficiary and the trust, paragraph 59, and say it only makes sense. If that's your parliamentary purpose, <coughs> when you come to write your legislation, you're not going to hide that requirement in, in a, a provision apparently dealing with the connection between the individual and the company. You're going to put it front and center, probably in 1B, because HMRC's case is the whole point of this, the whole reason we have this relief at all is because of a substantial connection. What is that substantial connection? It's this one year test. And that's front and center in the parliamentary mind as to why we're doing this. You would not draft the legislation in this way. You would not <coughs> make it very clear in 1B and 3 that what we need is an yeah, enduring I think, link. I think you've made this point. Um, yeah, <laughs> this is all part of your logical structure. It, it is, my lord. It is. I just turn my back for one moment. My lords, I'm very grateful for your attention. I'm advised that we do have copies of the trust in email form. Um, what would you like to do? Well, as long as they're legible, we'll, we'll have them electronically. <laughs> Um, so perhaps you could make arrangements to send them to my clerk. Yes. And uh, he will distribute we'll do that. that. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm very grateful for your attention. Unless there are any further questions, those are submissions for the appellants. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. Hay. Yes, Mr. Hay. My lords, I propose to adopt a similar order to my learned friend. Right. Um, I propose to address you first on dairy. Uh, given the uh, weight he now puts on dairy, um, and to explain why I say dairy is, actually supports the revenues construction and approach, and importantly, uh, can be distinguished on a number of grounds. Um, secondly, to then address uh, the historical position uh, that you asked my own friend about earlier, mm -hmm. um, because it's right that the revenue do rely on section 169O, uh, and I say that the historical position as to the introduction of trustees relief demonstrates why section 169J has to be construed together with section 169O. And when I say that in my submission that will become clear when we look at the historical position. And you will see that the upper tribunal had that very much in mind. Yeah. 
and then third to go through the provisions. Right, so we're starting with Derry, are we? Please. I, I don't expect it will take very long, um, but if I could t take it to Derry, I think uh, Melanie's friend gave it to you in, in the back of the authorities. Yes, we got it right at the back. Um, so, Derry, he, he took you to paragraph 7 to 11. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps I could just take you to the head note. Head note, yeah. Please. Um, you'll see under the health, the purpose of the tax law rewrite was to restore a measure of simplicity and coherence to the principal tax statutes. Yes. Section 132 I, Income Taxes Act was one of a number of provisions in, and I would underline that act, that appeared to constitute a clear and self-contained code for the treatment of a claim to share loss relief, such as that made by the taxpayer. Uh, one of those provisions you'll see contains a signpost, and then this, having taken the, such care to walk the taxpayer through the process of giving effect to his entitlement as part of his tax liability for the year specified by him, it would seem extraordinary for that to be taken away without any direct reference or signpost, then this is important by a provision in a relatively obscure schedule of another statute concerned principally not with liability but with management of tax. That's the key point of Derry. Derry was concerned with, you had in the Income Tax Acts a self-contained code setting out a number of statutory provisions and what Lord Justice Henson found in the Court of Appeal and which I unsuccessfully argued in the Supreme Court yes, I was that the section 42 of the Taxes Management Act was an important part of the context in which you were construing the Income Tax Act. Precisely, it's another tax statute. And right. recall, that, recall that schedule is an obscure one, is with respect to the law, but given it's a primary legislation at, directly in point. I, say, I, I, I ran that argument and lost my. <laughs> Yes, oh, Lenin, oh, I, as, as I said to my Lenin Junior, I came second in that case. He came first. He was he was for the successful, um, for the taxpayer in that case. Um, but the point is though, and that's why I say it's an important point of distinction, is in this case the revenue are not seeking to rely on an obscure provision in another statute. The revenue is relying on a provision with, which forms part of that, stat, that, that code. It's in the same chapter. It's in the same run of provisions that make up or constitute the code. Moreover, and I'll just make this point and then come back to Derry. Moreover, it is the only other provision in that code which deals with trustees' relief. And as I'll show you when we come to the historical context, it was introduced at the very same time as that section 169J equivalent. Those two were the only provisions that were introduced to deal with trustees. So it would be very odd if one was supposed to construe the one provision in isolation without reference to the other. But I, I hope to make that good when we look at the historical context. Can I just go back to Derry for the second point? Yeah. The second point is that the principles articulated by the Supreme Court in paragraph 7 to 11 are concerned with the tax tax law rewrite project, which is not what this case is concerned with. The legislation that we are construing is not part of the rewrite project. And there's a, a, an important gap that my friend missed in the historical context, which I'll come on to. It's not that these provisions replaced the retirement provisions. Well, I think it might probably be said against you that Lord Carnworth is making a more general point, mm -hmm. um, which is that the way that tax yep. statutes are drafted these days are full of signposts with 
logical structures and so forth. Yes. Whether it happens to be part of the tax law rewrite project yes. um, doesn't really matter because this is the way that parliamentary drafters now draft this kind of Act of Parliament. To which my answer will be, when we look at these provisions, that's not really... My, my late friend, what he's seeking to do is to look at one provision and say, well, this provision has yeah. these signposts to other provisions in this sole provision, therefore we don't look at anything else. And that's that would be, in my submission, to go flatly in contrast to what Lord Carnworth is saying, when he's saying is you construe, you start with the provision, but you construe it in the context of the other relevant provisions in that code, hmm. which is yeah. all we're trying to do by reference to the purpose. Yeah, and you're certainly, it seems to me, clearly entitled and right to say this is a self-contained mini code. Yes. We have to take it as a whole and we have to construe it as a whole to see what light it is thrown on the particular problem we have by pretty much anything we can find that has some probative value. Absolutely. And then that's why I say, though, that that's a stronger <coughs> point in my favour in this case, because yeah. the other provision I'm seeking to rely on is not, to give the example that Lord Justice Henderson raised when we were looking at the uh, the other parts of section 169 as well, can we find some help in any other, in one of the other types of... Yes. Uh, <coughs> I'm not seeking to do that. I'm seeking to draw or to rely on a provision, the only other provision... Yeah, you, you say the provisions dealing with, dealing with trustee disposal must be considered together. Exactly. Yeah. Because, and particularly when you look at this section 169, given it that only other provision, yeah. when the draftsman has drafted 1690, the, that must give you an insight into what he or she understood 169J to require or mean. And this is important because you'll see that the FTT, who of course found for the taxpayer, dismissed 1690. It said it's irrelevant because it's dealing with apportionment. <coughs> and that the upper tribunal rightly found was an error of law. And so if I'm right on my construction of section 1690, in my submission, that must give this cause significant pause for thought as to whether 169J can have the meaning that my learned friend says it does. Uh, and as I say, I fully accept that if you just look at 169J, there are two ways of reading that provision. But I say, but I say there are two ways of reading it, and the correct way is illuminated and informed, and in my submission put beyond doubt by section 169. Yeah. And you'll recall what my learned friend did not answer is critically section 1690 sub 6, the material time point. You recall that what he said was having dealt with all of the other sub other subsections, just said, well, that's dealt with in my skeleton argument. I don't really need to say anything more about it. But of course, section 169M, O, sorry, 169O sub 6 is critical. Because if my learned friend is right, why is the apportionment done by reference to the qualifying period? or the date at the end of the qualifying period. If the only relevant time is the time of the disposal, why is it not done, the apportionment not done, by reference to the date of disposal, the interest at the date of disposal? And he has no answer to that. Lord, that was all I was going to, unless you had any other questions on Derry, that was all I was going to mm -hmm. say on, on Derry. Can I then go to, um, to the Upper Tribunal decision? Upper Tribunal, or are we going to get our history lesson next? 
history lesson from the upper tribunal right. decision. Uh, you recall we don't have the provisions, and yep. so I was going to deal with it by reference, if I may, to the upper tribunal decision. Um, but I do say, and just before, and it's paragraphs by coincidence, uh, no, not what, it's, I was going to say it's 7 to 11 again, but it's actually 6 to, 6 to 13 of the upper tribunal decision. But I do say that essentially we say that this appeal should be dismissed for the reasons that the upper tribunal gave. Because you'll see when you go through the upper tribunal's decision that they carefully and conscientiously take on, head on, all of my learned friend's points. Now, you'll see at paragraph 6, importantly, they start with looking at the historical context. Uh, so 6 and 7... Uh, they say they think it's inst instructed to look at the history of similar reliefs that were previously available but were ultimately superseded. They note in paragraph 7 that relief for disposals of business assets has been a long-standing feature of the code since its introduction in 1965. That's the retirement relief. So retirement relief was actually there in 1965, is that exactly. right? I've tried at some point to have the reference. Yes. That. So... So you see, so, and, and, that's, and, and then do you see the, the upper tribunal make the point in paragraph 8 that until 1985, that relief wasn't available to trustees. Yes. Then you see, they, they set out the uh, consultation and the proposed change in 1984, <coughs> and then do you see this, uh, paragraph 9. That led to the inclusion in the Finance Act 1985 of provisions section 70 and schedule 20 which, among other things, conferred a new entitlement to retirement relief on trustees for certain disposals. That's my point about our sections 169J and O being the two provisions introduced at the same time. That you see in paragraph 9. So Those schedule are, 20 is the equivalent of O, is it? Yes, I'll show you. It's paragraph 9 of schedule 20 is the equivalent of O, and, I, and, 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 I'll, and I'll show you that, because my own friend didn't take you to, to that provision. <clears throat> but, but that's my point is that, is that those two are introduced together that's why I say even more it's, a, it's an even stronger argument for reading section 169J with section 169O you'll see at paragraph 10 they set out section 70 I'll come back to that if I may if you look at paragraph 11 included in schedule 20 to that act was paragraph 9 which was in these terms and there you'll see the equivalent of, or the predecessor of, section 169O. See 9.1, if in the case of a trustee's disposal, there is, in addition to the qualifying beneficiary, <coughs> at least one other beneficiary who, at the end of the qualifying period, has an interest in possession in the whole of the settled property, etc. And just to flag here, I'll come back to it, but do you see, that also supports our submission that the opening of section 1690 is not looking at at the time of the disposal, because you'll see, you recall, this, this is in the case, it's simply, on is simply means in the case of. And so if you read 9.1, it is clear that the point in time at which the interest in possession must be held is the qualifying period. This is, is also that, is that a period referred to in section seventy subsection four? Exactly. Do, is there an express definition which does that, or you just infer that? Uh, so I'll need to do it. When, can I, I? I'm going to come back, right. but I, but I will do. But it's the same. It's the same though. Um, it's the same as in our provisions in section one six nine. O and section 169J because that qualifying period and the material time are defined by reference to section 169J 4. So that's the further link between 169J 4 and 169N. 
which again makes it would be surprising if they weren't meant to be read together and interpreted together. Have I missed the point that the portion can change between the end of the qualifying period and the disposal? So, so, so in terms, of, this is in terms of one six nine zero. Um, so I'm sorry, I was looking at um, paragraph nine of Schedule Twenty yes. when when originally introduced. Yes, they're, they're not looking at the date of disposal at all. At all. At all. It's looking simply at the end of that one year period, the the the, the one year period in section in 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 our equivalent in in the equivalent of sub four. So that one year period where you have to satisfy the conditions of. So in that one year period, at the end of that period. Yeah. At that point, you look at. You, if, you if, take if, a snapshot exactly. to find the proportions. Between, so if I have, yes, exactly. So is it 10? Is it compared to, every, if right. this is where you've got more than one person with the interest in possession at that point, it, you, you get that proportion. So your proportion has at that e point. Even if by the time of disposal, that, that was my question. Exactly. Even by the time of disposal, exactly. the proportion has changed. Yes. So why? You've got two, two, two beneficiaries. Yes. At the end of the qualifying period. Yes. And one of them buys out the other. Yes. He only gets half. Le later. Yeah, between yep. just yep. between between the end of the qualifying period and the disposal. Yes. He, he doesn't get relief on the whole. He only gets relief on half. If that yes, if that's what he had at that point, it's it's fixed by reference to that point. Yeah. Why? Uh, sorry. What's the? I, I don't well, understand the logic of that. But well. But what it what it does emphasise is that what Parliament was concerned with was your interest in possession at that earlier period. No, I, I understand. Sorry. I understand. As, I understand, yeah. I understand yeah. that point. I understand that's why Parliament. Yeah. You say Parliament was interested in that. And yeah. So my question is why? I can't point you to any any any. any it, there's no explan. I don't think there's any explanatory material, or you'll find in the consultation why that is. The well, upper the, tribunal have extrapolated. They've got it in paragraph 8, haven't we, the consultation. There's a case for extending the relief to cover the disposal by trustees of business assets. So one would have expected it to be the same as if the sorry. individual... Yes, mm -hmm. sorry. That, so that, that, that gives you the purpose of the... Ex of, 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 yeah. of, but, but not the... No. I don't think it gives you the explanation to why that's chosen. But, but what it emphasises is, though, is that although Parliament looked, sought to extend, they deliberately haven't done it as a simple extension, or, so, or and have not simply applied the relief in the same way as it applies to individuals, but have done it differently. Just there is one point I want to <coughs> mention. I mean, you were telling us quite rightly that Section 70 of the 1985 Act came in at the same time as Schedule 20, Paragraph 9. But Section 70 was preceded by Section 69, which was itself the ancestor for what is now 169I, in other words, the section dealing with individuals on retirement. So both the retirement and the trust provisions came in in the 1985 Finance Act. Not, wasn't in the 1965. Sorry, sorry. 1985. Yes. 1985 Finance Act. I mean, I've got it in front of my nose. Section 69, yeah, relief for disposal by in our, individuals. I think it's also, though, in ours, in, in, our, in our, I appreciate you don't, you don't have the, the copies, but in, in, the, in the authorities, 69 is there. Um, can I just check? Yes, of course. <coughs> We've got section sixty nine in part at least. Yeah. 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 So I think what we need to look at, which we don't have, is section thirty four of the nineteen sixty five Act, which provided for relief for transfer on business and retirement. And so I think what one would need to look at is section thirty four and section. Uh, so section 34 of the 1965 Act, 
and section 69. Yes. The, of, of, well, because they both apply to individuals. What there wasn't in the 65 Act is the... Yes, for whatever the, reason, the 1985 Act was reenacting, so it would seem, or in, maybe introducing in varied form, yeah. the individual retirement yes. provisions at the same time as it introduced the trustee ones. So we have in the 85 Act, we have on the face of it a, a sort of mini code of provisions which yes. deals with individual as yes. well as trustee yes. disposal. So yes. that, that may be said to detract some of the force from your point, but it's only that, that the trustee provisions have to be read in isolation. Uh, to speak. No, so, so, so with respect, it's no part of my submission that they have to be read in isolation. Um, well, together, but, I mean, but, but, but they have to be read together. Yes. But, but also, I'm not. I'm not saying that in, in construing section 169J, you don't look at section 169I. That, uh, that that's that, that's no part. That that's not my submission. Well, except but I'm saying what? more. Um, uh, my own friend looks at section. We can see what section 169I, or in this case, section 69, uh, provides for. We can see that. Um, Section 70 uh, then addresses trustees. We can see that it does it in a different way. So the condition, yes, uh, so, so you've got the three-year period and the one-year qualifying. It's not one year up to the date of disposal. There's an earlier period. So a conscious decision has been made to uh, have a different period. So that's a different. So it's not just a an extension simple <clears throat> and then you've also got section 1690 or paragraph 9 of schedule yeah. 20 <clears throat> which there is no equivalent for individuals <coughs> If we go back then to the, so just before I go to section 70, can I just complete the, 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 the upper tribunal, this part of the decision? Yes, of course. Just only because <coughs> this picks up the point about uh, not being taxed or rewrite. Because do you see paragraph 13, the tribunal, upper tribunal identify that retirement relief was abolished by section 140 of the Finance Act 1998. There was then a different type of relief that was introduced, that's taper relief, which was then itself abolished and replaced with entrepreneur's relief. <coughs> so, so it's this isn't this isn't simply consolidation legislation or or, or, or rewrite. You had one form of relief. Yeah. Uh, abolished and replaced by a different form of relief and then I don't know if it's a different government or but different um, then a decision is to take to, to to abolish that relief and introduce a new relief which is largely based on the earlier form of relief <coughs> so we so we're not in tax or rewrite territory I fully take on board the point that my lords make that Lord Carnworth um, it, 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 his approach is, uh, is uh, there are some general principles in there, but it's but it's but but that was obviously the focus of it, the tax law rewrite, where uh, the rewrite project is dealing with a specific thing where you've got legislation which you are rewriting to make not because you intend to change the law, but because you want well, to. Well, that was that's 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 the importance of yes. the tax rewrite. Yes. Not, you don't need <coughs> to change the law. Exactly. Whereas but the other points he made about drafting style yes. are much more general. Yes, and I said that, that, and that's why I don't seek to say that what he says is irrelevant. Mm. Um, but I just simply say, and I take on board the signpost point. But, in, yeah. but, but I say more the, the more the other points uh, don't apply with with anywhere near the same yeah. force. Okay, but does, does it perhaps go a bit further than that? I mean, when you look at the Finance Act 1985, I mean that was long before anyone had dreamt of the tax law rewrite project. Yes. I think. 
Yes. So we have provisions in section 69, as I'm emphasizing, and 70, and schedule 20, which are in many ways the ancestors of yes. entrepreneurs' relief. Yes. So to the extent that entrepreneurs' relief is a repetition in very similar terms of the old retirement yes. relief in its 1985 incarnation, yes. then we do find it rewritten in tax law type language. I mean, that's self-evident, yes. just looking at it. Yeah. So, I mean, it does seem to me, although technically you're right, it may not be part of the tax law rewrite yes. project, it is in substance a kind of quasi-consolidation to which similar one would expect to apply a similar approach. Similar, but maybe, but perhaps not with the, with the in, certainly in Derry it was applied quite sort of strictly. Tax law rewrite, we don't look at what went on before. We don't look at what went on before. Well, we can't, we can't necessarily assume that Parliament did not intend to change the law. I mean, you can, right. you can say that. Yes, yes. And with this qualification, the explanatory note does say that the, it, it was intended to broadly. Yeah. Yes. Broadly. Right. Um, that's why I say so. Reflect. Crazy. And, 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 yeah. and that's why. And, and <laughs> as I say, I think the revenue adopted quite a neutral position below <laughs> on the relevance of the of looking at the retirement provisions. Um, certainly, my learned friend relies on the retirement provisions in his skeleton argument. Mm. Certainly, on my look, on my position is that on my reading of the retirement provisions, actually, they support our construction. Yeah. Um, mm. And so, but I don't, I don't say they're necessary as part of, but they are part of the context. Um, what I more rely on, though, is this point about them being introduced that they were introduced together, yes. those are the provisions that deal with trustees, <clears throat> and therefore it is not an obscure yeah. provision. Yeah, well, we've got that point. And, sorry, the repetition. Um, you see in paragraph 14 the, tri the upper tribunal quote the relevant part of the... Yes. Uh, and you see that's where it says about broadly. <clears throat> Can I go back then to paragraph 70, just as we are here, looking at paragraph 70, sub 3, section, sorry. sorry, section 70, subsection 3, Yeah. Um, what of course you do see is um, it's drafted differently, uh, but you'll see sub 3, relief from capital gains tax shall be given subject to and in accordance with schedule 20 to this act, <coughs> where the trustees of the settlement dispose of and so you see the reference there to Schedule 20, so just there reinforcing the link between this provision and Schedule 20. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. And just for your note, as it were, the equivalent signpost, if one wants a signpost, is in Section 169H, because you'll see Section 169O is actually one of the other provisions referenced, it's signposted. <coughs> Then do you see the trustees of a settlement dispose of shares or securities of a company? Then B, the conditions in subsection 4 below are fulfilled. Then this, with respect to a beneficiary who, under the settlement, has an interest in possession in the whole of the settled property, or as the case may be, in part of it which consists of or includes the shares or securities or the asset referred to in paragraph A, paragraph A above, but excluding for this purpose an interest for a fixed term. And in those sections, that beneficiary is referred to as the qualifying beneficiary. But that qualifying beneficiary is the person in respect, with respect to a beneficiary who, under the settlement, has an interest in possession in the whole of the said property. And so what that is doing is, in B, is telling you about the person in four. And that's not saying at the time of disposal. But it must be the time of disposal, because that's the, isn't it? The whole section is dealing with a case where the trustees dispose of shares or securities being in either case part of the settled property and the conditions below are fulfilled with respect to a beneficiary who well, under the settlement has an interest in possession. I mean, that must be surely at the date of disposal. Well, with respect, when one, when one goes through, the conditions in subsection 4 below are fulfilled with respect to a beneficiary who, under the settlement, has an interest in possession in the whole of the settled property, or, as the case may be, in part of it which consists of or includes the shares or securities or the asset referred to in paragraph A above. 
And so in my submission, it, that is all looking at the time at which you are looking at for, because it says in relation to a disposal of shares or securities of company, the conditions referred to in subsection 3b above are that throughout a period of at least one year ending not earlier than the committed period before the disposal, the company was the qualifying beneficiary, family company, and either a trading company or the holding company of a trading <coughs> group, etc., B and C. And so in my submission, that is looking at the status or the capacity in which that the individual has at that time, that one year period. But again, it's referring back to the qualifying beneficiary as defined. It seems to me at the moment that definition, as in 169J, is tied to the date of disposal. Although the draftsman does then look back to an earlier date, and unlike the data draftsman, knows when to use a past tense, as the company was. But, but with respect, you, if that's right, then all, all the in four, yeah. you, why do you need the definition of the qualifying beneficiary? Why, surely it would just say the individual. Why, why do you need to define it then? Well, I mean, the answer is that possibly that could have been done, but the fact is the qualifying beneficiary having just been defined, one expects when you're talking about the same person thereafter to use the same defined term. Well, but, and but you that, do it in relation to a definition which is tied to the date of disposal. Uh, but with respect, well, it, with respect, uh, B doesn't do it by reference to the date of disposal only. It simply, it simply says an interest in possession for, and in my respect, in respect for submission in A, B, and C, when it's referring to the qualifying beneficiary, it's referring to a beneficiary who has an interest in possession at, that, at the time we're looking at A, B, and C. And that construction is, in my submission, the only construction which makes sense when we then look at paragraph 9, in the next paragraph, if in the case of a trustee's disposal, there is, in addition to the qualifying beneficiary, at least one other beneficiary who at the end of the qualifying period has an interest in possession in the whole of the settled property, or as the case may be, in part of it, etc. So in my submission there, <coughs> this is clearly looking at the position where you have two people who have, who both have an interest in possession at the end of the qualifying period. Two, for the purpose of subparagraph sub one above, <coughs> the relevant portion is that which at the end of the qualifying period, the qualifying beneficiary's interest in the income of the part of the settled, settled property comprising the shares, securities or assets, in question bears to the interest in that income of all the beneficiaries, including the qualifying beneficiary, who then have interest in possession in that part. So this is all premised on the qualifying beneficiary having an interest in possession throughout the one year qualifying, qualifying period. Where, where do you get throughout from? Well, so it's another snapshot. The end of the period. Where, where's the throughout? Sorry, so it's um, so it's, so it's for the purpose well, not throughout, but for the purpose of the relevant portion of that which at the end of the qualifying period. Yeah. So it's the it's, it's it's from the end of the qualifying period. Yeah. So the qualifying period takes you back to um, four A and B, mm. which do 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 look which it does look at the, the qualifying period, you don't satisfy those conditions if you are the, if you have an interest possession or at the end of that period, or that you satisfy the conditions in, I should say, in, in A, try and put it neutrally, you satisfy the conditions in A and B at a point in time, at a snapshot, you have to do it throughout a one year period. And what this is saying is, it's not looking at both of Sorry. these, 
the qualifying beneficiary yes. has to satisfy the what Mr. Firth calls the entrepreneurial connection yes. throughout a period. Yes. Yeah. But when you're coming to look at what interests under yes. the settlement there are, you take a snapshot. Yes. Well, because but that's that's for for, simpli for simplicity. Yeah. The Parliament has said there, but the snapshot they take is the end of that qualifying yeah. period, um, and so you're looking at he has the whatever that connection is. I say the distinction between us obviously is that he he says it's just what he describes as the entrepreneurial mm. uh, uh, attribute. We say it's it has to also be a qualifying uh, meet the definition of a qualifying beneficiary through that period. But at the end of that period, they are saying. In addition to the qualifying beneficiary, there is at least one other beneficiary who, and this I'm taking this from the beginning of 9-1, yeah. in addition to the qualifying, so this is all premised on the qualifying beneficiary at the end of that one year period being or having an interest in possession. Well, I'm not sure if that's right. I mean, if you look at the way it begins, paragraph 9, if in the case of a trustee's disposal, there is in addition to the qualifying beneficiary. Pausing there, we know we have a qualifying beneficiary in yes. respect of the trustee's disposal, yep. because we've been told that by section 70, subsection 3, little b. Yes. So then we say, right, what else has to happen? At least one other beneficiary who at the end of the qualifying period, and that's when the second snapshot date comes in. That doesn't alter the fact we already have a qualifying beneficiary but then if we look at two... Has an interest in possession in the whole of the settled property. It's in the first, it's a relevant proportion of that which at the end of the qualifying period, the qualifying beneficiary is interested. It's, it's it, and uh, two is clear that it, 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 it's premised on the apportionment being based on the qualifying beneficiary having an interest in possession at the end of that one year period. Just a drafting model, I think. Well, but with respect, if my learned friend is right and one is only concerned with somebody who has a qual an interest in possession at the date of disposal, then why, what would be the purpose of one, two, and three? You would simply say, you would simply apportion by reference to the, you would say, well, if there are, more, if there is more than one qualifying beneficiary at the date of disposal, you apportion by reference to the, qualify, the qualifying beneficiary's proportion at that date, i.e. at the date of disposal. Why are you concerned with the one year, the one year period in 4A and B? And that's the significance of, um, when we look at 1690 sub 6 that my learned friend glosses yeah. over, the material time. Might might be helpful to have a few worked examples just to show how you say this is meant to work. So you 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 you've got a qualifying beneficiary on the date of the disposal. Yes. And let's suppose that he's got a thirty percent interest yes. in, in the settled property. He's only a qualifying beneficiary because he satisfies the connection with the business um, requirements. And then you've got another, let's say, 30% beneficiary who had that interest at the end of the qualifying period but no longer has it. Yes. Why, why, what's the logic behind restricting the relief? In fact, would you? I mean, on one reading of the opening words of paragraph 9, you actually have to have two beneficiaries mm -hmm at the date of the trustee's disposal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It says, if in the case of a trustee's disposal, there is, in addition to the qualifying <coughs> beneficiary, yeah. at least one other beneficiary. Well, I mean, uh, so, so with respect, it's if in the, case, in the case of a trustee's disposal, so that's not imposing a, a temporal point there. It's well, just it, saying it, it, where there is a disposal. Well, um, it, it's temporal in the sense that there has to be a disposal, i.e. a charge to an event that gives rise to the yeah. charge to tax. Uh, uh, so, but, but then the next part is, so it's saying where there is a disposal, then this, there is, 
is this must mean at the time of yes, disposal. As yeah. disposal, yeah. there is, in addition to the qualifying beneficiary, at least one other beneficiary. And if there isn't, why do you, what, what relevance has this got at all? I go. Sorry. Sorry, Mark, I don't mean to tell you, I just. No, 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 sorry. Just, sorry. just before I go off on a wrong tangent. It's a bit Alice in Wonderland. <clears throat> so, so, I just want to make sure that I wasn't going off on a, on a tangent. So, so, we do say. Uh, that doesn't need to be a qualifying ben the other qualifying beneficiary doesn't need to be a qualifying beneficiary at the date of disposal but for this provision to kick in he must be he or she must be a qualifying beneficiary at the that, at the end of that one year qualifying period and we say that's the natural reading of that opening period yes, and, and also Sorry. So is this right? You, you just, just. I think we went around this circuit a few minutes ago. You say that this would apply in a circumstance where, at the end of the qualifying period, there were two beneficiaries. Yes. One of whom was a qualifying one. Yes. And the qualifying one um, bought out the other beneficiary. Yes. But they would then only get fifty percent relief. Yes. And, 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 and that, just out of interest, the qualifying period. Maybe I. I'm not sure that's in dispute. I should say. I don't. Well, okay, but, but hang on a second. The qualifying period. When when might the qualifying period end? So so it's so it's so under so that's so that is under <coughs> four. And that's it's it's any one year, any period of one year within the within the three years before the date of. Disposal. So the end of the qualifying period could in fact be the date of. Disposal. Yes. Mm. <coughs> Whoops. And, and that's the contrast with the individual provision, because the individual provision only looks at one year up to the date of disposal. Sorry. The first of the, of the condition A, and then there are... Are we helped in looking at um, the actual provisions we're trying to understand and construe, sure. which is supposed to simplify what had gone so, before, yep. to look at this historic set of sections, which seem to have even more difficulty and ambiguity. I mean, I'm, I'm struggling at the moment to understand what real assistance we, we should get from this sort of archaeology. So, so I say... My my main point for, for for going to the historical is is more the fact of how this was introduced. So, uh, seventy and paragraph nine introduced together, they deal with trustees. I, d I don't place any particular weight on the wording in those provisions. <coughs> yeah. But obviously, my learned friend is taking me through those provisions. I say that actually they. Well, you clearly need to look at them, but if having looked at them, we find. They leave us even more puzzles than we yeah. had before we began looking at them. The answer may well be, um, in this particular case, they're not going to help us. Well, so. Um, that seems to be a subject which Rathson had a pretty clouded yeah. view of. <laughs> when well, I, I mean, that, this, this is not a reenactment. No, no. no. You know, it, it, when, yes. it, when something came yeah. in at a later stage, it wasn't this. Yeah. It, 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 it looks, you know, Yes. You know, the tune sounds familiar, the words aren't the same, <laughs> but does it really help? Well, uh, only to this extent. And as I say, the reality is, I think, as I asked my learned friend's submissions, he was relying on Section 70 to say, well, it's drafted in the same way, it means the same, and it supports his construction of, mm. of, of the TCGA provision. I'm relying on the historical provisions to say, well, the equivalents were introduced at the same time. Mm. Yep. I don't necessarily need to look at the detail, but I was simply trying to meet my learned friends. You, you say that this shows there is a proper link between one six nine J yeah. and one six nine, which justifies, which justifies, and um, and reading them together yeah. requires reading them together. Yeah. That's which, as far as okay. I go. No, in fact, I, sorry, sorry. To read them together. I mean, in a sense that that 
follows as a matter almost of first principle in Reynolds construing any legislation. And after all, it, it is now contained, albeit by way of amendment, in the consolidated DCGA. And, and that's all I've seen. And that's the context in which we have to actually construe that's, it. That's all. And then I was trying to meet my own friend's point, and I think all, all perhaps we've demonstrated in showing is that those provisions, it's not clear that they support, that they show that it, would, it, that it means what my own friend says. Uh, I say it shows the opposite. Um, so, therefore, the, 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 the need to go through them in detail is, is not, I say, there. I say what, what's, what I take from the historical consequence. The only, point I, the only reason why I hesitate is I suspect that when you get to these provisions, although drafted differently, by these provisions, you're now talking about 169. Yes. Yeah. Mm. yeah. When, when, when you go through 1690, for example, um, some of these same questions would <laughs> come up that one grapples with and that one starts to try and understand, well, why is it that way? But the underlying point, and when one looks at 1690, <coughs> the underlying point is mm. that as with the earlier provision, the, 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 the 1985 provision, it also does not simply apportion by ref it, well, it does not apportion by reference to or look at the interests in possession at the date of disposal. It looks at and fixes on the interest in possession as at the earlier date. So it assumes that the person who satisfies section 169J has an interest in possession at that earlier period, which is consistent with our construction of section 169J. And in short, that's why we say it's that that's what I seek to, to get out of section 1690. And that's what the upper tribunal did. Yep. They but, say But I think the point is you you don't need to go on a long historical excursion no. through section 70 of the 1985 Act and schedule 20 no. of that no. Act no. to make that point. No. And I apologise for doing well, It would be nice if it threw enough light on the ambiguity to resolve it. But at the moment it seems to be far from throwing light on it, it just adds to the confusion. Yeah. Um, in which case we're not going to be helped by it. Well, on that note of confusion, <laughs> <laughs> shall we have a break? Thank you. How are we doing for time? Uh, um, well, I've comfortably finished this afternoon. I, I, I think the break will help um, just to sort of uh, concentrate minds. Um, 45 minutes? Right, fine, excellent. Two o'clock. Well,